Hey everybody, time for part four in our mediation and moderation series with SPSS using Process Plugin version three. So today we're gonna to work on two-way interactions, just like last week we did regular moderation with uh, covariates. Today we're gonna to do interactions with categorical moderators. So in Process you can use categorical M, I don't know that you can really use categorical X so much. I think you can probably do both together, but then you might as well do ANOVA because if both of them are categorical, what you're looking for is an interaction in ANOVA. So we're just gonna work with categorical M in this video and we're gonna use that same data set from the previous video that looked at illiteracy, income, and murder rates across all 50 states. So looking at this model visualization, what we see is we're still trying to predict Y with X and our moderator here is categorical. So we'll get multiple B values predicting Y and multiple interaction BX, B by X interactions, um, B being the slope rather. So it's moderator by interaction here. Um, and so we'll have multiple lines for the moderation. And so you're really looking to see if there are any of those that are, have an interaction because it's difficult to interpret categorical interactions. Okay. The nice thing is, is the, the follow-up test to a categorical interaction is actually easier than completely continuous interactions. So bonus for using categorical M. Okay. So this particular example, what I did was I took the uh, data set from last week, which is the state's data that was in R and categorized murder into low, average, and high. Now, if this were a real data set, I wouldn't want to split that data that way. I want to use it as a truly continuous variable, but I need data sets sometimes, so we make them up as we go. So we're going to use murder as this categorical variable with the caveat that don't categorize things if you don't have to. Right. Our, uh, we're trying to predict uh, income, so we would expect maybe income to be inversely related with murder rates in a city or a state and we're also going to use illiteracy as a predictor and we'd also expect that one to be negatively correlated but maybe there's an interaction between the two um, and if you watched last week's video you already know there is so the first thing we have to figure out for power anyway is how many ivs are going to be and this is a common issue with uh categorical or dummy coded variables it's just figuring out what the heck is going to happen so obviously we'll have our predictor, our continuous predictor. Um, so that one's easy. But murder here is a categorical predictor. And anytime you use a categorical predictor in regression and you dummy code it, what happens is you get K minus one um, number of variables. And I have a separate video on dummy coding that explains dummy coding more, but the basic idea is that it creates little barcodes for each group. And so each group, uh, you don't need three columns to measure three variables. You actually only need two because you can create a unique pattern of variables that account for all of those groups. So what happens is one group gets coded as all zeros. One group gets coded as one and then zeros. And then our last group, because we have three um, low average high, gets coded as zero and then one. And so well, this makes this sort of cute pattern. Let's see if I can insert a little table here. Where we have what group we're in and so let's say we're gonna do this as the low group is the um, comparison group. And this is what's gonna happen in the background. In SPSS, that was what process does. So that's just called um, contrast coding, if you're familiar with that term. Okay. And so in each group, I always think about this as barcodes because it makes sense to me, but each group is their own unique pattern of codes. And so we don't need a third variable where the low group is also marked one because they already have their own unique code. So I needed two variables because the first one at one, I couldn't make this last one also be one. And if I tried to make it two, then we're pretending like this is continuous and we don't want to do that. Okay. 
So you have to have enough columns to create each person having a unique code out of zeros and ones. Um, you can only use zero and one. And so what happens is you get k minus one variables. If you try to code this on your own and include that third variable in the analysis where you have the low group as like zero, zero, one or something, uh, it would break. So you would get a singular matrix or in SPSS that often comes up as he Hessian matrix, not definite. And so that means that you've included perfectly correlated variables. So there are a lot of like math matrix algebra reasons why this work, uh, doesn't work with three variables. As long as you kind of get the idea that each group has their own code, um, that'll help you get through this analysis. Um, the other thing that's going to be nice is that whatever the variable is, is going to be the group who's all zeros versus the group who's a one. So each variable represents group with all zeros versus group with a one. So that being said, how many variables are we going to get with three levels? We're just going to have two. So we know that illiteracy is continuous, so that's one. Now, moder murder is going to be two. Then we're also going to have the interaction, which is going to be <clears throat> the number of, of four X times the number for M. So we're going to have two because it will create an X by M interaction for each level of each. So if let's say you were doing this with uh, two categorical predictors, you get even more of them. And so that's why if you have two categorical predictors, ANOVA is just a little easier. Okay. It's also a framework that makes a little more, um, like people get it rather than trying to do it through regression. Okay. It's mathematically the same though. Anyways, side topic. Uh, so we're going to get two for that. So we're actually going to have five predictors and then any CVs, which we don't have in this example, but we'll have one for illiteracy, two for murder and two for the interaction. So we'll have five. Now we talked about this in the last video, but there's two real ways to think about this. One for overall R squared for the entire equation. That would be all five predictors or, uh, the second way, which is for an increase in R squared. So in this one, it would be all five predictors. In this one, it would be just the interaction, which in this case is going to be two predictors. <clears throat> and it's two predictors because we're adding the interaction terms, which we already decided was two predictors. Okay. So let's pop over to G power and make that happen. So we're going to come down to F test. For the first way, we're going to do fixed effects, multiple regression, um, deviation from zero. I'm gonna hit determine. Let's pick a number we haven't done before. How about 0.07? Kind of a medium effect size. Calculate and transfer to main. Pick your favorite alpha and power levels. So 0 0.05, 0 0.8 are kind of my industry standard. We'd pick five. So in this example, we need 177 states, which we don't clearly don't have, but 177 participants in whatever form that is to find a small effect. If we were testing just the second one, what we'd do is change this linear multiple regression. We flip to R squared increase direct. We put in the same number uh, point. If we decided that the interaction was 0.07 okay. <clears throat> number of tested predictors would be two and number of total predictors is five. So that just happenstance that it's the G power default. Now we need only 132. So we're, the reason the power of the sample sizes are different really is because we are predicting the same amount of variance in two different ways. So the first way we're predicting the entire R squared for all five predictors. This way we're predicting the R squared for the, just the two extra predictors. So it would depend on what um, you knew you could reasonably estimate. I would suggest that this way is a little better if you know how big you expect the interaction to be because you're trying to power the interaction specifically. So this document will have all of these pictures in it online on our OS, uh, OSF page after we're done. So let's go to SPSS now. 
and work through data screening. So uh, again, a quick reminder, if you wanna understand all the steps to doing this, check out our other data screening videos that explain the why. We're just gonna walk through how to do it. So we're gonna click Analyze, Descriptives, Frequencies. I'm really interested in the couple of variables I have. So we're gonna use Income, Illiteracy, and Murder, since we're doing a very simple moderation here. Under statistics, I've got a couple of categorical ones. So I might want the mean, the min, the max, standard deviation. I'm going to leave frequency tables on, although that's not very helpful for income and illiteracy. It's good for a murder categorical variable and hit OK. So what I'm really interested in is, is there any missing data? Nope. Okay. How do these look? So it gives me the mean over here, which is, I wish it wouldn't, but uh, are these within the range of the expected values. So there's no zero, uh, negative incomes or negative illiteracy. So these look about right. All right, I'm back. SPSS had a meltdown. So here we are again. <laughs> what I was saying was, um, these frequency tables are maybe not so useful because <clears throat> they're giving every single value. So I'm just gonna strip, skip straight down to our categorical variable just to make sure we have enough people in each category. So this is a concern, obviously, with ANOVA and t-tests. It should still be a concern over here in regression. So uh, we just want to make sure we don't have categories that are basically empty or too small or maybe 10 to 1. Um, there's no hard and fast rule for this, uh, but 10, 15 is a pretty good split because the data is made up. So I would say uh, everything looks pretty good. We don't have any missing data, so let's move on to outliers. Now we're, we're not really gonna be able to totally use the categorical variable in our analysis because the regular regression window um, does not handle this well, <clears throat> as far as I remember with SPSS. So what we wanna do is, um, I think it will treat it as continuous if I move it over. We're just gonna look at the um, X and M options here. So we're gonna predict uh, income with illiteracy. <clears throat> and if you have this variable dummy coded, you could go ahead and do it with the dummy codes in here. But the idea behind using processes is that you probably don't. I'm gonna click on plots, get Z pred and Y, Z residual and X, histogram and normal probability plots. Okay. Under save, we're gonna save the big three. Continue and okay. So that was Mahalanobos, Cooks and Leverage. Sorry if I went too fast there. All right, so I'm gonna hit the go back to the data button and we're gonna look at these bad boys. So let's go over back to Word and figure out our cutoff scores. And this time I've learned my lesson if you've watching the videos recently that Adobe also tends to crash my computer. Um, so I just cut and pasted the chi-square cutoff table into the document. So I do learn things as we go here. Um, with Mahalanobis, the degrees of freedom are the number of variables in the equation. Well, it's the number of IV variables. And we only put in one because our other one is categorical. So we're kind of screening the continuous variables here. So under one, we're gonna use P less than 0.001. So it's gonna be 10.83 down here um, because we have only one continuous variable that we're screening, which is illiteracy. Uh, yes, illiteracy. <clears throat> For cooks, it's four minus, uh, four divided by N minus K minus one, which is uh, 50 minus k is the number of ivs in the equation which is one in this example and one down here left over from last week's example sorry about that so four divided by 48 is 0 0.083 and this is actually going to be four divided by 50 just 0 0.08 So let's go back to SPSS and screen those columns. So what we're gonna do is create um, some bad columns. So I'm gonna do transform, compute variable. And we're gonna create a column that marks if a person is an outlier or Mahalanobis. So I'm gonna do Mahalanobis distance greater than our, new, our cutoff, which is 10.83, hit okay. What that's gonna do is it's gonna code anybody whose score is greater than that, which we can see is since we only have 50 data points, it's pretty easy as a zero. So we don't have any Mahalanobis outliers. Okay. 
And with only one predictor, you don't tend to. It's kind of hard to be really far away um, with only one X. <clears throat> We're going to do that same thing twice more. So we're going to do this for cooks and create a bad cooks column. Okay, so cooks distance, double click, greater than 0.083. Okay. And what this does is it allows us to look at all of them in tandem, so together, instead of trying to like sort three different ways. One more time, and transform, compute, compute variable, we got bad leverage. Point oh eight oh. Okay. Now I could sort these and look at them. I think it's pretty obvious in this case that there's maybe a couple of people down here that are problematic. But the last thing we can do is create one more column, so transform compute variable, and we're just going to create a bad total. So this will give us um, a good idea of which people have the most problems, or which states in this example. Uh, the order doesn't matter here. So I added all three of those together, and now this would be the column that I would want to right click, sort descending, or you can do this under data, sort cases, either way. And I can see that this set of people up here, there's one state that ha is an outlier on cooks and leverage, which could be problematic for our analysis. Now we know this state is a real state and these are their real numbers, so I'm going to go ahead and leave it in. But if this were real participants, I'd probably exclude it. Right? And that's probably because their, their murder rate is the highest. Right? And their illiteracy rate is also pretty high though. Uh, and their income rate is low. So that combination is not, um, is not good. And so um, <clears throat> what we're going to do here, though, is leave this one in because we know it's a real state with real data. But you could decide that you wanted to screen this column and it's two strikes, you're out. And I want to exclude that column. I want to exclude that person because they're bad. And you can do that with data, select cases, and tell it to filter people out based on that bad total column. All right. Let's go back and look at the output for our... Uh, assumptions checks. I can remember where the window is. Here we go. So first chart here is our normality chart and it looks pretty good. Everything's centered between two and two and uh, over zero. Maybe a slight skew over here in the positive range because it's not quite as tall over here and with this one little dude. But this is one of the best charts I've seen so it looks pretty good. Our linearity chart looks really pretty so everything's really close to the line so the data is probably linear. Our chart here, maybe not so great. So we want it to be centered around zero, both directions. So you got this one little person out here. Also, the data is not evenly spread around zero this way. So this is a good example of sometimes what I call raining, where there's a clear line at the top and then it's um, the spread is further at the bottom or the reverse. Okay. So maybe some issues with homogeneity. For homoscedasticity, this part chart's pretty good, minus this one little dot. If I drew a line around all of these data points, they would be pretty blobby, so fairly evenly spread. Okay. So maybe some issues with homogeneity, maybe not so much with homoscedasticity. Um, the last thing we want to check is correlations, but we only have one ca uh, continuous predictor, so no point. Okay. Now that we've done all of our data screening, we would write up that we checked all these things, maybe some homogeneity problems, and move on. So let's click Analyze, Regression, I'm going to do Process Version 3. And so what I want to do is stick Y in the Y, um, axis of Y variable spots. We're going to predict income with illiteracy, and we're going to use our categorical version of murder here as our moderator W. So when you switch from Process 2 to Process 3, one of the big switches is that um, mediators and moderators are very, are very separate now. So be sure you don't stick it in the mediator box because if you stick it in the mediator box and pick model one, it will not be happy with you. If you had some other variables you wanted to, um, to adjust for, you could stick them in the covariates box. We want to pick model one. Model one is a two-way moderation. 
click multi-categorical so that I can turn on multi-categorical W. You can do a categorical X. Um, I will tell you that if one's categorical, one's continuous, it is much easier to interpret and understand if you put the categorical one in M. Obviously theory might dictate this question as well, but it's just gonna be so much easier if the categorical variable is the moderator, which in this example is W, sorry. So it continues, you can click options. Um, most of these don't mean a whole lot, but we're gonna click mean center for construction of products. And that's gonna center X because X is continuous. You don't necessarily have to do that when one's categorical and one's continuous. I'm going to so that you see that if you're watching the SPSFs and the R video, you can see that the outputs match. Uh, probe interactions, so you could tell it to always show you the interaction, um, or you can pick a, a alpha level here. I'm just gonna leave it at point 10. On conditioning values, that doesn't actually matter in this case because it's gonna separate them by level of the categorical moderator. But if you're watching this and you have a continuous variable, um, I tend to pick the simple slopes. This is the more common style. They're both fine, but know which one you're picking. And on categorical variables, I don't think it'll give you Johnson name in because that uh, is only for continuous variables. So continue and okay, and then wait. That one was actually too slow. Hey, let's copy this over here and go over to Word so we can type a little better. Okie dokie. So scroll up here to the top. Um, we can see here how it coded that set of categorical um, predictors. That should look very familiar. This little table we made before. So now we can uh, interpret W1 and W2. So in this case, my interpretation is W1 is the um, group of the one. So level two, level two is average. Oops, in my data set. <clears throat> versus low, because low is the group with all zeros. And W2 here equals, um, sorry, uh, high versus low. And that's indicator coding. If you wanna switch this up and do uh, coding where it's one to two, two to three, you can also do that. There are oh, other options in that multi-categorical window to get the combination that you like. We're gonna compare everybody to low murder rates. In this case, it might make sense to do low to average, average to high, but we're just gonna leave this one as is. First thing I'd wanna do is write up the overall model. Is it is the model significant? So we'd pull our F values. It's a little weird because it crossed pages here. So our F value of 544 okay. equals, here's F. So we're going to use all of these bad boys. So 5.23 p-value is equal to, if I can find the equals, 007. And then our r squared is this one here, so 0.37. We way underestimated overall r squared. Now I want to come down here. Let's just put this here. <clears throat> we could talk about each variable one at a time. So literacy. B value, we're gonna use this first piece here under coefficient. It's a very big number, but that's because of the scaling of the data. And we just mean centered, we did not z-score these. Our T value is our second degree of freedom from our F statistic. Okay, our degrees of freedom residual, 1.09. We're also gonna use P right here. P equals 0 0.280. And my interpretation here would be that this is not a, not predictive. Okay, pretty much most of us would agree that 0 0.3 P, it means it's not predictive. Okay. The, but it's also positive, which is a little odd because what that implies is that as illiteracy lit increases, 
income also increases, which most of us would not think would be true. Um, but in practice, they're not related. We could talk about W1, which remember we decided up here was average versus low. So what is the difference between um, income in places with average murder rates versus low murder rates? And so there's a negative 2.91.82 uh, difference between those two, and that is not significant. I'm having trouble typing today. Okay. So the interpretation here is that there's a difference in income between average and low. Okay, and it's not significant difference. And then we want to do that same thing for high versus low. Okay, and it's also not significant. So there doesn't seem to be a relationship between the murder rate and the uh, income levels. So we'd interpret that the same way. So difference in income between low and high, not significant. Now, if you really, if you really want to understand this better, one thing you can do is go back to SPSS and calculate the means for each of those groups. So to do that, we're going to do data split file going to split on our categorical output and it says organize output by groups and move our categorical variable into it. So remember that split file doesn't really split the file. It just says it's like a temporary split. So that'll go away when you turn the data set off, uh, turn SPSS off. So now let's do descriptives and we can go frequencies and we just want to look at income because that's the one we're most interested in turn off that frequency table and let it just give me the means. And I had those means on before. So what that's saying is that the uh, at low murder rates, the income is 4,500. At average murder rates, the income is 4,500. And at high murder rates, the income is 4,200. But none of those are significantly different. Now, these numbers are not exactly subtractions because, uh, well, they might be. If I can math, low to average, no, because of the other variables included in the equation. <clears throat> Next thing we want to do is do the interactions. So this is interaction one. So this is average versus low by illiteracy, which is, like I said, a little weird to think about because it's the comparison of average to low uh, income rates by the level of illiteracy, but illiteracy is not a level anymore. It's now a continuous variable. And we want to write all that up, but I'll spare you the pain of watching me not be able to type today. So 497.71 dot dot dot. And this one is not significant. So there's no interaction. And then int two here is uh, low high versus low by illiteracy. And that one is negative 1525.24. And we'd write all the rest of that one. And this one is significant. So yes, interaction. Okay. So there's an interaction of high and low, high versus low given illiteracy. But like I said, this is incredibly difficult to interpret. And it just, it's hard to understand. So what we're gonna do is just look at the simple slopes. So here what this does is it tells me what that interaction is, which we already figured out. This tells me the addition of that interaction, which is really handy if you are wanting to do power planning. So the interaction added 0.17 to that overall R squared of 0.37. So this is the addition of the interaction. Okay. And sometimes people report those change statistics. 
But what we really want is actually down here, and these are those simple slopes. So when we talked about simple slopes before, what we've done is looked at low average and high for uh, the different continuous variables. And we, I've talked about how it's not really broken into groups. What it is is sort of shifting the data around so we can see it better. So if we only look at this one area of the data, what does it look like? Now what we're doing is literally breaking this down by level. So it's the slope for x to y given a level or group, if you want to think about it that way, of m. So this one here means that we're working with the low group because they're the ones coded as one in SPSS. So it uses the coding that you've used, Go back to the data here. Um, so in this case, I have on the labels, but the labels are just hidden uh, on top of the numbers here. So those are coded as one, two, three. You can also see this under variable view, click under values. So that one, two, three is corresponding to these labels here. So for the low group, illiteracy predicting income, right, is our original B value that we've already seen, 622.66, and we report the whole thing, and so it's not significant. For the average group, so average murder levels, Uh, illiteracy predicting income, our B value is now 124.95. This one's also not significant. So at low and average levels of murder, illiteracy does not predict income. Now at the high group, illiteracy, which is ridiculous to type over and over again, predicting income is now significant, and that's negative 9.902.57, da, da, da. And this one is significant. So what I would say was that at high murder rates, Illiteracy predicts a decrease, because this is negative, in income rates by 902 points. So a decrease in income by about a thousand points, if I round up, uh, at high murder rates. So high murder rates, illiteracy really matters. Um, at low and average murder rates, illiteracy doesn't matter. So that's how we would report, um, report these things, but how might we graph this? Okay. And so uh, there's not really a good solution in um, SPSS. And, and what you'd wanna do instead is probably do this in Word. And there are options to um, generate code for visualizing interactions, but I didn't, I forgot to click that button. So under, let me back up and show you again. So analyze, regression, we'll pick process. Under options, let's now click generate code for visualizing interactions. You could have done that before. I've talked about on my channel before that these graphs are really ugly. That's a limitation of SPSS. So if you like Excel, use that bad boy instead. And so it does make you this little spot here. And we'll hope that SPSS won't crash. So I'm gonna highlight everything from data to the period. We're gonna do is file, new, syntax. Don't be scared. Paste that in and highlight everything. Hit go or play or run. You're gonna get a new data set, which kind of went away, but what happens is it makes you a new data set, wherever the heck that went. There it goes. With these uh, different group levels, so you could make this a little prettier. What's happening is the literacy, it's low, average, high, so it breaks that into uh, the standard deviation, one below and one above. 
our categorical murder rates, and then our predicted income at those variables. And this is where you would want to just kind of clean it up. So uh, given that SPSS has already crashed on me today, I won't go nuts on this, but when you double click, you'll have some abilities to like click on these options and change this to low, average, high, get rid of that great background. Um, the hardest part is like, you just wanna make sure you wanna add the lines because these dots are great, but people are, it's gonna be much easier to see with those lines. So here's how you can make a graph or you can transfer this data over into Excel and um, play with that a little bit more, clean that up. Right. So altogether, that's how we would calculate power, do a moderation with a categorical variable and process in SPSS and the start of a plot for uh, writing these variables out.